And then if anybody has answers to their favorite insect or whether they've been to the beauty before, please let me know. Thanks, Angela. Welcome, Marjorie and Ross says. So we've asked a question. Um, it is, what is your favorite insect? Or um, have you ever been to the beady before? So feel free to try out the chat. Oh, great. Uh, Robin says, uh, I like butterflies. That's great. And honeybees all well, are in the group, yeah, with the, with the wasps, great. Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started now. Is that okay? Yeah, that sounds great. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm going to get started on the intro slide. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our BD at home today. And today we're joined by Nancy Lee, one of our museum interpreters, and we are going to be talking about and doing a dissection of a wasp nest. So before we get started with the experiment along, I want to just make sure everybody has their tech working and Zoom working. And if there are any questions, feel free to drop those in the chat so we can help you troubleshoot. Um, today, as I talked about, we are uh, Nancy is presenting to us today, and my name is Angela. I will be facilitating both questions as well as uh, questions in Zoom as well as Facebook. So definitely drop any questions that you do have in the chat at any point during our presentation today. And just a little bit more about where the museum is and where we are located. We are here on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. And as you can see, we are situated right here on the UBC campus amidst a lot of really fantastic, <clears throat> a lot of really fantastic museums that are, sorry, <clears throat> that are also currently open at the moment. So if you are in Vancouver, feel free to drop by and visit us. And our biggest a uh, museum specimen that we will not be talking about today, but definitely worth a visit to take a look at is our big blue whale skeleton that you can see in when you first enter and first visit our museum. And within our museum, we have thousands of more specimens in store for, for you. And our neighboring institution here is the Biodiversity Research Center, the BRC which has over 50 faculty members and their graduate students and post postdoctoral researchers studying all sorts of things, everything from ecology to genetics, looking at species and organisms from all sorts of families and genuses. And within our collections itself, we have, we're, uh, we have a lot of specimens 
divided largely up into six different collections. We have our tetrapods, anything that walks on four legs, marine invertebrates, uh, fungi, and other uh, plants and things that are slightly kind of related to plants, and as well as our entomology, which will be the focus of our presentation today, our fish and our fossils. And when you enter our museum, you will see these beautiful black cabinets filled to the brim with all sorts of specimens representing species from largely in Western Canada, but also all over the world. And today we are coming to you live from the Discovery Lab, which you can find at the back of our museum. Now I'm gonna give it, uh, pass the floor over to Nancy. Great, thank you. I'm just gonna start sharing some slides to start off and I have a question for everybody. And my question is, how do you feel about wasps? So feel free to type that, tell, type anything in the comments, no judgment, be honest, let me know how you feel about them. Uh, and then and, and Angela, let me know if anybody does uh, uh, type, it, type it out. Um, let me see if I can see it yeah. as well. Okay, so, uh, I'll give a second for that, just in case. Oh, fantastic. Carla says, yeah, Carla made a note here saying that she is, they are amazed by how they build their nests. But, well, me too, absolutely, that's great. Okay, so I wasn't sure how people are gonna be feeling. I didn't know if they're gonna be saying they're scared or they're annoyed, which happens to me too, uh, you know, when they're buzzing around your food. Um, but I think that for me, I feel, uh, first of all, that they're really beautiful. I chose this cuckoo wasp here. Um, our collection, our uh, Spencer entomological collection at the BD Biodiversity Museum here uh, focuses on the insects of BC and the Yukon, so this Western Canada, and we've got this uh, amazing Yukon collection as well, and this insect is up there. So I've just got another slide too of a very similar uh, cuckoo wasp, and I just thought I'd show this one too because it has the scale bar in here. So this is one millimeter. So this whole insect, this is a little bit smaller than the other one probably, um, is uh, only a few millimeters uh, long. But look at how beautiful it is with these different colors. So, you know, I just wanted to uh, show a, a little bit of the diversity of wasps and show how I feel about them. And I think they're, they really are um, beautiful in a lot of ways, not just when they're rainbow colors as well. Okay. I also um, uh, threw in one more as well. The one previous, by the way, I did also, another reason I chose that one is because um, our curators in the Spencer Entomological Collection found um, uh, that species in Richmond, Richmond, BC, right here close to the museum, uh, not that far away. And so we do have a brilliantly colored uh, insects around, even though, you know, sometimes it seems um, we perceive that it's very, very dull around here. Um, but this, they're very tiny, that's all. Um, so another beautiful wasp, cuckoo wasp, or another one. Um, sometimes I also think of the skill, as as uh, Car Carla mentioned as well, um, that they have this amazing nest building. And so here we have a potter wasp. Anybody who does pottery might, you know, relate to this wasp in particular. And it's bringing back a little bit of mud. It's gathered so that and and a little ball. And it's made this gorgeous vessel here, you know, just like a pot with the with the little rim and everything there, um, and has this this beautiful, uh, like amazing waste as well. So let's go to one. So this is just one kind of nest. So they're incredibly diverse in the types of nests they build. Some don't build build nests, and some do, and some just are solitary, like this one. And it's not going to be, uh, you know, working cooperatively with the uh, with the colony. It's just going to be on its own. And in fact, this will be stuffed with things like spiders and it will just have one egg in there as well per pot. Um, here's a, so I also think of them as good moms personally. So there's uh, there's a lot of good sisters too, I should say, you know, especially in the colonies, that they are going to be good at caring for the young in general. Um, and so another, another mud nest being built. That was a, a mud dauber. Um, here, we've got a lot of diversity in the size of the nests as well, and the, these, uh, this species here uh, can actually go to uh, a million individuals, so uh, really amazing nests 
uh, and this is in the neotropical areas. Um, so this one, I believe, is from Colombia. Uh, I can check on that. Okay. Uh, so you can see that I, I put a little happy face here too, um, uh, here, so next to the person's head, just so you can see it better. But this entire nest is on the ceiling of this, this cave area. And uh, there's a nut, so they can be made a paper like that nest, but this one is an organ pipe mud dauber uh, named for this style of nest that has these long tubes. So one wasp will build several tubes together. And the, again, with the being a good mom, they will, uh, she will go and collect those spiders and be able to sting them to paralyze them, um, to keep the food fresh, and then stuff the, these tubes with, that, uh, with, with the individual eggs. So there is going to be one, one baby wasp in each of these uh, tubes. Um, and so, um, and these kind of, you know, if at the end of the season, you can kind of pop these off and, and see, the, see them come all off like that. Uh, this, uh, there's also a really a diverse uh, behaviors in terms of how, how they're going to uh, get their young, um, you know, fed and cared for. For this one, this is in the same spe the genera, uh, genus that we're going to be talking about. It's Dolico vespula, but it is called Arctica. And it is uh, going to be able to be a nest parasite. And that I should say that about the cuckoo wasp as well, that really beautiful rainbow one we looked at. That one and this one, they, uh, they actually put their eggs in the nest of another wasp, a very closely related wasp too. So this one will, will be um, parasitizing the nests of uh, Dilico vespula uh, um, uh, arenaria, which is the uh, aerial uh, yellow jacket that we're going to be looking at the nest of today. And so same genus, and yet this one is going to get the workers of the host to take care of its young. And in fact, the queen, before she even lays eggs, she is going to be coexisting with the queen of the host um, and be able to, to blend in there and not be kicked out. Uh, so that's pretty amazing. So there, I mean, it sounds like there's some chemical mimic, mimicry that's happening there that allows them to not get you know, um, smelled and, and kicked out. So we'll go to the next one. Uh, they're also very ecologically important and beneficial to humans as well. So, uh, and one of the things that they do uh, ecologically is uh, they can pollinate plants, plant pollinate flowers. And this is a fun example, but there are many, many examples of pollination. And uh, this one over here is a dwarf orchid. And what it has uh, evolved is this, uh, the texture the smells the, the, of the, the pheromones and the shape and you know rough shape of a female wasp and the female wasps in these species do not fly and the male flies and finds the female uh, to mate with and so this is how this plant pollinates it it, uh, it gets pollinated it mimics a female wasp the male moss male wasp will not know, uh, presumably, and will uh, then try to mate with it and then get the pollen stuck on. So there's a number of orchids that do this. So they are specifically very, that's very specific in how they get pollinated, but there's many wasps that just visit flowers as they're collecting nectar um, and also help pollinate. Now they are different from bees in that they are, they don't have, you know, the hairs that are all over them. And they are also, they don't have the flattened hind uh, legs that you might have seen on bumblebees or, or, or um, honeybees that the, the bees collect the you know, pollen off of their hairs and, and put them on onto their legs to carry. Um, but you know, they will do, do some pollination and that is important. Uh, another, uh, uh, and you know, that's important to humans as well for crops and, and, and gardens and that. And then they are also very important predators. So that is another thing that is beneficial to us. And so I've got a picture here of a wasp um, 
getting a caterpillar. Now, this is uh, oftentimes people will see this and misunderstand and think that the wasp is eating the caterpillar or other insect that it's eat eating. And in these, in the case of these social wasps, they're not eating them. They are uh, processing them and bringing that 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 meat back to their young. And so again, those good sisters uh, bringing it back to the colony. So uh, they will have to, you know, get, they get wasps and insects bigger than themselves. They can skin them and then um, cut them into pieces, just like I guess a hunter would, and then bring that back to their young. So uh, the very, very important for controlling their prey population. So ecologically important in that way but also uh, for our, our gardens and our crops as well. So uh, important to us as humans. Um, so just uh, there are a variety of wasps out there. Um, there's over 100,000 species already described. There are plenty more that aren't described yet. Uh, so they are an incredibly diverse group and it is not just one clade either. It's it's uh, not a monophyletic or not a group that has one single ancestor. Um, they do share an ancestor with the bees and the ants, um, so they're quite varied. Uh, and uh, there, there are many diff different types. So uh, we'll go on to the today's uh, feature wasp. And this is the uh, yellow jacket. Uh, and you might think of the yellow jacket as one species, but we actually have several different species of them in the Vancouver area and all over North America and over the world. Uh, so these are some of the ones that are around here. So the common yellow jacket, Western, Ariel, and German. And so we're focusing in on this one here, the Ariel yellow jacket. Um, some people sometimes ask, what's the difference between a yellow jacket and a hornet? Well, we have something called the bulb-faced hornet, and it's in exactly the same genus as this, uh, as these yellow jackets. And it just happens that that one has a white patterning, uh, white and black, and this one is yellow and black. Um, there's another group that are called the true hornets, the much bigger ones, uh, that so that you can call those hornets. But the name hornet doesn't often mean much um, because they, they're all in the same groups. Okay. So uh, here is a nest of our aerial yellow jacket. You can see they're kind of yellow. If they were a bulb faced hornet's nest, this, the shape would be very similar. Um, they can be, the, the bulb faced hornet can also be found around here, um, but you would see the white markings instead. And this is up in a tree in this photo. And as the name suggests, they are often found uh, in the air, in, in uh, trees and bushes and that sort of thing, rather than underground nests. So other species um, tend to go for underground or in more other cavities and things like that. Now there's always exceptions though, so it doesn't mean that it can only uh, be up high. Uh, it, uh, they can also uh, nest uh, in, uh, in the leaf litter and they will, they have even been observed to be, to be able to, the workers have been able to take out bits of soil to make more room for the nest as well. So they can do that. Uh, but typically if you see something like this around this area, uh, it'll either be the, you know, this aerial yellow jacket or the, uh, the um, bald faced hornet for the shape. Okay, so, uh, so let's go to our nest dissection. Any questions so far from anybody, Angela? Yeah, we have a few comments in the chat so mm -hmm. discussing your question about what do they feel about uh, wasps. Oh, we good. have Gus that he doesn't, he doesn't like them. He got stung twice over the summer. Mm -hmm. And we have a note from Robin that says uh, they've been reading about wasps and they're seeing them differently now. It's really neat. Um, oh, mm -hmm. I got stung this summer too, actually. Yeah, I wasn't, I mean, it was out of nowhere in the morning and I was passing by a hidden uh, nest and I, there wasn't anybody around or anything around as far as I could see. And I just, uh, it just happened to be like, just chance that it knocked into me. Uh, so I understand that definitely. Um, so yeah, they definitely have that sting to protect, but you know, the, and the thing that I always try and keep in mind, though, is that I was really close to their nest filled with, you know, potentially hundreds of babies, right? If you had hundreds of babies or baby sisters, uh, you'd probably be pretty protective as well. <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, yeah. Oh, just a quick question from Carla. Yeah. Um, they were mentioning that for the first time this year, we saw a swarm of hundreds. They flew over our house and their buzzing was audible. They settled on a tree branch. 24 uh, hours later, they were gone. Were they migrating? There are swarm founders. I don't know what species that might have been, or was it possibly even like the, the honeybees also do that swarm founding. So where they will go and find a location. Um, so they might be splitting off from a, from a nest as well. So not too sure. Yeah, <laughs> but that can happen where they're founding a, a new nest, especially um, I know that with honeybees too, they'll, they'll, they'll move over to a new place or part of the colony will move over to a new place. Yeah. Um, in terms of migration, we, we uh, I don't know, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of like a micro migration, but it's not to, not necessarily for weather or anything like that. Yeah. So most of the wasp species, like the social wasp species we're talking about today, they're going to, you know, run their lives through their, they, you know, this species starts in early June here in this area, you know, a little bit earlier in down south, and then they're going to continue on to maybe October. And then almost everybody dies out at the end of that, um, except for the new founding queens and uh, so the, the next generation there. <laughs> okay, great. Thanks for asking those questions and making those comments. I really appreciate that. Um, so let's go on to our nest. Um, so where did it come from? I wanted to you know, make people feel comfortable about this. This one was found on the ground, already knocked down from a building that was under renovation called the Biosciences Building here at UBC. Um, so when we have something like that, that's, you know, not going to survive or already dead, uh, we're going to, we can call that a salvaged specimen. Um, and so they, uh, there, you know, there might have been uh, some individuals still hanging on inside the nest, but they were, the, the certainly the larva would not have been able to survive survive if they were not cared for um, in the end anyway. Uh, so, and I'm going to thank Aludo for this uh, nest. And I just wanted to mention too, that if anybody does do any collections of like salvage things, uh, it is always very important to write down your data. So one thing is, you know, the collector's name, but also the date and uh, where, it was found, where it was found. And that's the really important data. And that's what, you know, what's really also very great about our scientific collections is that is a huge amount of data. Just having those things about our um, specimens means that they are records or vouchers of those things being there at that time. I'll just uh, mention too very quickly that in the posting uh, for this event or for, for this session, uh, there was uh, a couple of uh, attachments. If you wanted to to print them out, you're welcome. You're welcome to, or if you already have. And so one of them was just a data sheet in case anybody wanted to follow along. So this is the data that, um, if you're looking for it, it is uh, from uh, last year, last summer, June 14. So early on, like I was saying, early on in the summer uh, is when they're starting the the nests. Um, so this is not at the end of the the cycle here. And then over here, there's just a coloring sheet as well available. So that has um, the anatomy of the wasp. Okay. All right. So let's open it up. And it's already come apart a little bit. You want to stop sharing your screen for really quick? So you're oh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. Thank you. OK, fantastic. And if you want to pin my window, you can do that too in the corner. So you can go to the dot, dot, dot and pin that. Um, OK, so uh, we've got these two parts. So the first thing I wanted to say is that there is this amazing paper, right? So imagine if you were able to like quickly make paper and be able to build things, uh, like build your entire house and your furniture and everything uh, with it. So I wondered if anybody out there already knows the answer to this question. Why are there different colors of lines on this nest? Can, anyone, can everyone see? OK, maybe I'll do this. OK, so um, let me share a different screen. And I'm going to share some adults that were on the nest. Can you all see that? Okay, so this was these adults are from this nest as well. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to see if I can show you a little bit better view of the paper nest here too. So can you see these amazing colors? See all that variation? Yeah, we have a suggestion from Carla. Uh -huh. Is that what they eat or digest? It was a good good thought. Okay, so they are definitely chewing up the wood. 
so they're going to, um, I'm just going to give it away now. Uh, the, they're going to different sources of wood and chewing it up. So maybe they've gone to a fence, one place has a little bit different color than a picnic table that, or some bark. Uh, and all of those different places mean that they have these lines all over the outside here in the outside covering part of the nest, right? I think that's really beautiful, but it's also, for me, it really indicates how much work really goes into just creating this little piece of nest here. So I'm gonna switch back to the, uh, the panels here. And so, you know, they, they would be going to every, um, let's see, uh, sorry, I'm just gonna grab this again. So they're, um, oh yeah, structure. Okay. So they're going to be adding that on, but that little section here with this little line represents an entire trip where they've had to go find some wood, chew it up, mix it with their saliva, fly all the way back, and then lay out a little strip, right? That, and then eventually you get these layers. So I'm just going to unravel this a little bit so you can see that better. And there are a bunch of individuals in this too. But you can see even just the covering here, this little piece of covering has all of these layers here, right? You can see that? Um, and, and all these little tiny balls of, of paper that they've made and have put together, right? Each one of those uh, is, a, is a trip, right? It's a lot of trips that are involved. Um, uh, I also wanted to recommend too, if, if people are interested in you know looking at their own nest after this after the session i would say that you know like i said all the individuals die off you know maybe in october so if you're looking at the winter time and you find a nest you know that's that nest will not be reused you could you could take that down uh, if you're looking for an inactive nest you know when it gets to be really cold like that uh, that that's a good time so november december then that, those kind of times you it's it's fine to take down the nest um, I would recommend if you can avoid killing a nest. Uh, I understand that people have to be safe, but if it's a nest is, you know, reasonably away from people, there's really no need to kill them because they are so important ecologically and, and, and beneficial to us as well. So I would just say, you know, if you needed to, sometimes we, what we've done around the museum is put a, a sign up just to warn people that there is a nest and give it a little extra room. Uh, but a lot of times uh, the people I think uh, are quick to, to take down nests that don't have to be taken down. Okay, so here um, you can see there's a lot of individuals here and then I'm going to, also show you what's uh, open. This was the opening as well. And we'll kind of pick out some of these as well. Let's see what we've got. So I'm gonna take this part apart, this part, this, this section apart. Um, I think these fell out of here. And for this uh, type of wasp, the aerial yellow jacket, there can be up to seven layers here. I've got a little bit bigger nest to show you a little later, but here we've got the inside these combs. Got a lot. These probably fell out of these combs, and we've got a variety of individuals. So I'll just show you a little bit better here. Okay, there you go. So it looks like this one really has three layers. And, and the outside covering here. And we've got, we can take those apart, okay. Um, feel free to ask questions as we go along, but I'm gonna pick out a few things. So in here, these can be mixed different types of cells as well. So what you have happening is that your queen is going to start the nest and it's just going to start with, a, um, she's gonna start with a few cells, but she will find a good place that she thinks is safe. She will start the, 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 the uh, making the cells and she will lay individual eggs in the cells here. Uh, and then when the first worker emerges and then the rest of the workers emerge, then she's going to be staying in the nest to lay eggs, focus on that, there's going to be the workers then can go out and do the foraging, right? So, uh, uh, and what happens is that the egg 
then hatches and you get larvae. So I'm going to just pull out some of the larvae for us. It's a quick question from yeah. Rosinga's. They yeah. were wondering if the nest has any smell to it. This nest is um, was frozen. So we froze, so it's just, I just took it out of the freezer at the last minute just so that it wouldn't get too mushy because there's a little bit of ice on it. Uh, so no, I'm, I'm good with the smell. I don't know, it's a little bit musty, like kind of the way like a little bit of wood would smell. Yeah, <laughs> nice question, I like that. So this one's good, uh, but we, we freeze things. Yeah, that's how, how to keep things fresh. Um, okay, so maybe I'll swap here. Um, okay, let me gather a couple of them first. Okay, so I've got a larva. Um, we did have an adult before. And so there's more adults. Uh, okay, so the larva first. Let's, let's start with that. So here, I'm going to try using the microscope again. Sorry about all the switching. But I think this will be easier to see on the microscope. Um, as, as you do that, there's another question from Robin. <laughs> Yeah. A new nest every year. Yeah, so they will. Well, so everybody dies <laughs> except for the new queens, and the new queens will overwinter. Uh, as far as I know, there's a lot of variation between wasps. So you know, every time I say anything like this, I always feel like there's going to be an exception somewhere in another wasp. There's so many differences, but in general, uh, they will. Uh, you know, those new queens will find. The new the the males and they the they'll mate and then they'll be fertilized and then they'll be able to stay fertilized through the winter and uh, you know find a, a safe spot to be dormant and then in the spring those new female those new queens will will found their own nests yeah, in general yeah. does that help okay um, so we've got the larva here and I'm gonna also show how there's different sizes of them that I can see here. Oh, sorry. The other way. Okay, sorry about the focusing. Okay, so see how they're all tucked in there? So I wanted to show you like a couple of really quick videos because we were looking at a dead nest. Uh, I wanted to show a couple of things on here. Oops. Uh, so I'll share back this um, here. This so this is actually a different kind of wasp. Can you all see that? This rainbow nest here. Is that good for people? And it's showing up well for me. Yeah, the videos. Oh, great. Okay, thanks. Um, so we've got this. Uh, this is a different nest that this is called a paper wasp. Uh, and there's several different species of paper wasps. This is Fuscatus. And the, these nests do not have that outer covering. They have just a little like chandelier type nest and, they're very, and then they're much smaller colony sizes. And what they do is without that outer covering, one, one different strategy they have to protect their nests um, is that they're, they're, there's a little stem that you can't see, it's not in this video, but the little stem um, hangs down and they can put an ant repellent that they make with their bodies. They rub that around on the stem there of the chandelier. And then that prevents ants from being from coming in and raiding the, the, the nest of all the babies. Uh, so that's their way. So they don't have a covering. But I thought this was really fun because uh, this really shows that sort of paper making process. You can see her, um, you know, chewing. This would be the foundress, the, the, the queen. And uh, she's, you know, kind of working on the paper, the purple layer because they've given her different colored paper to to build with in, in I guess this is a lab. Uh, so you can see uh, it's probably just, you know, uh, what do you call it? Um, hot glued to, uh, you know, an enclosure. And she's got some purple paper that she's, you know, working with um, or purple. Yeah, so that you can give them paper. So that's just, uh, they did that for fun. You don't need to give them different colors of paper, but, um, but then it kind of shows, you can see that layer adding on. And then the other one that I wanted to show was this one. So you can see what the actual larvae look like when they're alive, okay? And this nest again was uh, um, a, you know, a, a saved nest that fell down. Uh, and this person decided that it was going to try and raise the, 
the little wasp babies. And so this reminds me a lot of like, you know, you know, the mom and dad bird uh, feeding the little chicks in their nest too, right? So uh, he's got a little bit of cat food there uh, and he's offering them to them. And he did this over a, a number of days. Uh, so they're, they're quite big in, in this, this part of the video. And you can see them taking them. And it also, to me, it kind of shows them kind of getting excited uh, to get the food. So those adult workers are all female and they would come back to the nest and they would, with the, you know, the caterpillars and other insects that they found, they would be able to bring back portions of that and then feed the babies. Um, and the babies, interestingly, also do something that, that is uh, uh, really amazing. They produce a uh, carbohydrate rich substance that they feed back to the adults. So the adults will feed on, on nectar um, and, you know, fruit juices and that sort of thing out in the wild um, or out from away from the colony. But the, the larvae also, so that seems to create a, a give and take between the adults, the adult workers and the larvae in these wasps. So there's, um, there's a word for that when they're feeding or passing material between each other like that. It's called trophallaxis. So there's uh, larval adult trophallaxis in, in wasps where the larvae are kind of encouraging the, the adults to feed them. Um, so you can see here, then this is the next, the, the pupil covering. Uh, we're going to take one apart over here as well, see how we do uh, cutting into it. But that cap is built by the larva. Once it's fully grown, it starts spinning a silk cap, and then it has to chew out of that when it's ready to uh, leave the nest. They will poop after they turn into the adult. And so that, that poop is called meconium uh, and that's left in the cell and then they come out. So uh, so let's see if we can get into the, the cap here. Um, not sure what species this is, but this is a yellow jacket as well. Okay, any, any questions, Angela, while we're switching? Yeah, so we have a question from Miles and Elizabeth mm -hmm. is asking if you have any tips on how they can fill out the data sheet Oh, okay. So uh, what we have, it's, it's totally the, we have the collection date. Uh, you, I showed it on camera. It was uh, June 14th, 2019. So that was on the right. Um, the date recorded is your own name. And then, so what did you notice? So number one, we've already looked at the nest a little bit. So if you have a observation about the nest, or if you wanted to draw a little bit of the, you know, we talked about the lines or the stripes and, and where they came from. So maybe you might want to draw some of the paper covering of the nest uh, in your circle. Uh, you might want to, you know, make a note about something about the nest there. Uh, we talked about layers as well. So that might be something you found interesting. So the nest in this case has three layers, but they can go up to seven layers in this species. Um, so it's up to you really. It's pretty open-ended for how, what you, you want to write down out of this. Um, for here, the reason I put these little labels here is if you wanted to cut them out and stick them on, but that's up to you. you know. And uh, we're gonna talk, we, we, sh we looked at the larvae. So let me just remind you what that looked like over here. Um, so here, we've got a larva here. So, you know, even if you wanted to draw that, or if you notice something about that. Uh, they don't have any legs when they're larvae. They um, do have a little head capsule uh, and they're quite squishy. So whatever observations you wanna make about them, yeah. Mm -hmm. And there's um, a question from Janine. Do we, have, uh -huh. do we have any native endangered wasps in BC? Oh, I, I, mm -hmm. I, we probably do and I don't know. So I, I'm sorry, I don't know the answer for sure. Uh, but for endangered, to so actually be on the, th the, the red list and the blue list or the, the species at risk list, that information is all on the BC and uh, Ministry of Environment's uh, um, you know, webpage. So that can, that can be easily accessed. Yeah, sorry, I don't know offhand, thanks. Uh, Okay, so that, that's good. Okay, so with the larva, we've got that uh, going here. Um, and we'll see, so that was from the nest directly. And then we'll see if we can pick out one as well. So I'm going to stop sharing uh, over here. Uh, okay, we'll see. Um, so these are smaller ones here. The, that one that was dropped out was quite big. But there's 
Oh, well, this one's pretty big too. So I don't know. I don't know if that's gonna work, but you can see that one's come out and that came out of just this area here. And I can see there's, you know, another way to do the data sheet would be to count, but I'll, you know, there's so many here that I, I wouldn't recommend it at this point. Um, so, but if you were doing maybe a research project, I read a paper that did a lot of the counting of, of like, you know, how many, you know, are in the stage and that stage and that sort of thing. Okay, so the next stage after the larva are all fed up or fed thoroughly. And then they, uh, they, they spin their little cocoon and then they're going to be a pupa. So let's see if I can find one here. Um, so you can kind of see the parts on this one. And let's see if I can show another one. So we've got the pupil coverings. Let's just cut one open and see what happens. And yes, I am using nail scissors. I have all these dissecting scissors, but my na the nail scissors are smaller. So I've cut this one open. Let's see. I don't know if you can see that. I'm going to just see what I can. Oh, this one's got the eye color, I think. So the pupil stage, the pupil, the, they're going to be really doing that amazing metamorphosis that butterflies do. Oh, this one doesn't have the forms yet. So, so this one is quite a lot like the, the larva. I put it on the magnifying. In a moment, I'll, I'll magnify them all. Uh, let's try and find a better one. Um, feel free to ask questions anytime too, Angela. So. Yeah, sounds good. So just a few questions on the larvae stage, actually. Um, Ross and Gus was wondering how small is the larva's mouth and does it have eyes at that stage? Uh, it has eyes. Uh, it, the mouth, I think you could kind of see it in the video a little bit, but it, it, you know, it's it's not as big as when they're adults for sure. Yeah, so they are quite small then, mm -hmm. um, okay. but they're there. Uh, they are chewing, right? They're, uh, so, uh, yeah, they're eating that protein. I'm gonna see. Okay, so the other thing I wanted to do for you too is maybe take apart the layers because I haven't seen that. So over here. Are you guys ready for that? Is it's okay. This is um, so. What I'm going to do is just sort of stretch it a little, so you can see that there is a little stock there, and then I'm going to take that off, and we'll see all the layers. So then we can get to more PP. Maybe I can get one that's a little further further developed. Oh, this is good. Okay. All right. Let's see if I can show you this now. I'm going to try the magnifier again. So we had our larvae, we have bigger larvae. You can kind of see the, the eyes there, right? You can almost see the little mouth as well. So that helps answer that last question. And then we had this layer here. I don't know, it was here. We opened up this one, these two. And I'm gonna see if I can find one that's a little bit more developed for you. But I also have, this one that was one of the ones that had already fallen out. So you can see all those parts of the wasp are coming in, uh, but it's still, you know, a pale color before it actually, you know, is ready to, you know, harden up and, and be an adult. So um, I'll just show you a close up too of all the other ones that fell out. Let's see the adults there. Sorry, I hope I'm not making anyone dizzy. Okay, there's some. Okay, a little bit more of that form. So, you know, people, you know, refer to it uh, as a little bit of a joke, like they're like a smoothie inside when they're going through metamorphosis. But really those cells, a lot of those cells are like being rearranged uh, when they go from larva to adult. It's a huge, huge change, huge transformation. 
And the question from Robin on Facebook. <laughs> we were curious that when we were watching the video for feeding the larva, <laughs> are they able to survive on things like cat food? Uh, those ones were fine, yeah. I mean, it was, seemed like a lot of labor, but they, I think they were fine, yes. Yeah, so it's just protein. Um, and then when you're raising insects in the lab, you can often like get, uh, you know, like for example, if you're raising caterpillars in a lab and you're raising a lot of them, you wouldn't, you know, necessarily just get leaves, fresh leaves all the time. You could get a medium, uh, a media, like an insect media, which is some, you know, like a, a, a slurry that you can make that has all the right nutrients. So yeah, definitely. Um, I don't know how far he went with it. I don't, the end of the video stopped before anything turned into an adult, I think. So, so all of these cells, by the way, like I'll explain one more thing is that they, oh, is that a pupil? So these are all the pupil caps and they're all seem like the same size to me. I don't know if you can see if you think that as well, uh, but in these wasps, they can have larger cells and that'll be when the reproductors are formed. So like I said, these, um, you know, the, these will turn into adults, but these will be worker adults. And then for the larger cells, which I'm not sure if I can see, but you know, often they'd be, maybe these are larger. Uh, the larger cells would have the new queens that would go on to found their own nests the next year. So the new queens and the males, so they are the reproductives. Uh, whereas these workers are sterile, they would not be able to, to have their own babies. Okay. Quick question from Robin on Facebook. Is every wasp in the nest a female? Uh, no, so they are making males as well. Uh, and in fact, in this species, it's interesting that they, so the males are there for reproduction, right? So they don't do a lot of work but they will be mating with the new queens and that's important as well. And so they uh, do make the males, but some nests will be uh, specializing in males and some in females and then some other nests in, and this is all in this species, by the way, uh, some would have a like flip back and forth. So they have make males first and then females. So uh, there's some specialization too. So Thank I you. think this, oh, does this show the head more? Okay. Hoping for a better one. Okay. And just a gentle reminder, we are at 143, so we might be okay. near the end. Of Fantastic. Okay. So we are. Um, let me let me cut this one open then. Let's let's cut the next layer just to see and see if we get some different pupae at different stages. Um, okay. So this is this next layer. Right, and you can see. These ones are, these are already empty. And do they reuse the cells? They actually can reuse the cells. So they don't have to have a fresh cell every time. Um, it's not exactly two, it's up to, it can go up to almost two times. So on average, so some, some are gonna be reused and some won't be reused. Uh, okay. What else can I see? Let's try one of these, okay. Yeah, feel free to keep asking any questions. Oh, was that on there? Oh, I answered that right, right when she typed that out. Okay. Okay, yeah. Yeah. okay I got that one then. <laughs> yeah, I was just answer I was just saying that. Yeah, that's a good thought. Um, anything else? What is it like? Um, as you cut, a question from Nicole, or I think, I think it's Nicole. Are the eggs laid in batches? For example, a lot at once, then a pause, then a lot again, or are they laid on an ongoing basis? I believe, as far as I know, and again, there's probably exceptions, but I believe that they are laid in an, on an ongoing basis. So uh, a queen, um, the queen would be laying, laying several eggs a day. And so it would take her some time during the day to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, and the, uh, what is the white? So I wanted to know if the, Kevin was asking about this white stuff, which is the pupil caps or the little larvae that we have here, which is kind of an off-white. And these are the larvae that are, um, see over here? Those are larvae. I don't know if I can, at some point it goes out of focus that way. So does that help, Kevin? Okay, I think, I think that that's the only white stuff that is. Is there other white stuff? 
Okay, so we'll see if we we'll see if we see anything else in here, and then well, maybe that's oh, maybe this one's for me. Okay, this one's a good one. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's do one more. Yeah. Um, so these all look small to me. They don't look large. Maybe that uh, that side of that other one was a large one. But these all look small, and so that can there's going to be a mixture of that in the different layers as well. Uh, maybe the last, like if it's a seven layer nest, then maybe the last layer is just going to be only reproductives um, and all big cells instead of uh, sm small and big cells. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I think I'm not getting in our nest today and in other nests and at other times it'd be different. I'm not getting really great, uh, really fully formed pupae that are um, white but look just like the adults. So, uh, but I'm sure they're in here. There's a lot of cells in here. But we're getting mostly just the larvae and then some fully formed adults. That one. Again, it's another one. So I'll just put that one on magnifier again, just so you can see what I've been pulling out. So that was the larva. I pulled that one out. You can kind of see maybe that's the head end there on the top. Um, this one I pulled out, which is another larva. And this one was one of the adults. Um, you can see the stinger in this one, this adult. Can you see that with the little point there? So uh, for the queen, the, the queen is using her uh, ovipositor as actually for egg laying, but the other um, wasp uh, females are using their, their ovipositor for stinging. And so males don't have something to lay eggs with, right? So they don't have sting, stingers. So only the females sting. And, um, you know, the males are just sort of, waiting around anyway, hanging out, uh, not doing a lot, not, a, not doing a lot of protecting. Okay. Uh, okay. And I think, uh, let's see if I had anything else for this. Um, but you can see there's the, the cat food again. We'll see if, if anything different happens at the end. You can see they're pretty, um, they're pretty active here. And then, okay. Um, let's see there. Okay, so this is just uh, the differences between the individuals as well. So we've got the queen here. Um, and a lot of times you have like a bigger abdomen. You can see that little, little the stinger there. Uh, we've got the one. I think there might be a leg in the video. We can oh, okay. see, we see some, a, a small part of the larvae. Oh, okay. Sorry. I'm going to just make sure I've got the right things shared. Sorry about that. Thank you. Is that better? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so, oops, I'm gonna go back. Okay, so, uh, so we've got the worker here, um, and then the male, looking, you can see a big difference in those antennae, you know, they're gonna be sniffing, smelling for females, so maybe that's the reason, I'm not sure, but they do have much longer antennae. Um, and they don't have that really pointy back end, right? They have that rounded back end and no stinger. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, okay, I, well maybe if it, while people are thinking of your their last questions, your last chance to ask questions, I'm just going to share uh, or show some of my nest specimens as well, just to see a little bit of variety. Uh, so I'm gonna do that. And here we've got. I was talking about this is those paper wasps and they don't have the covering. And so this is Polistes dominula. And so I've got a little, so this gives you a real sense of how small they can be, right? So this is just probably the initial nest. They can get bigger than this. And then one individual that was found, probably the queen then, right? And I've got a bigger, let's see if I can get this over. I've got a bigger 
Arenarian-esque. So this is the, um, so this nest, oops, sorry about that. You can see there's the outer covering is huge. This is my hand for some um, scale. And then this nest has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven layers. Oops. And uh, so there's that one as well, but the same species. So they can get much bigger than the nest that we had. And, you know, for this species, they can go up to, you know, a thousand individuals and they can even get up to, you know, some maximum, um, those really big nests that have been documented have gone up to 3000 individuals uh, in a colony. So really they can get quite big. Okay. All right, well, I think I'll wrap it up there, Angela, if you wanted to take us out. Thanks so much, everybody, for joining us today. Um, if you have any last questions, please do ask, and, and we'll go ahead and, and answer. Yeah, so just a quick uh, question from Robin from Facebook. They say, so I understand that when the larva, uh, larvae has completed most of their transformation into adults, they spend some time as white before they turn yellow and black. Mm -hmm. So... They, the, so that's what I was trying to find for you. So I was only getting the larvae that were sort of um, plump and larval looking still, but I was trying to find you pupae, um, a singular pupa. And when they're transforming, they're, uh, you know, all of those insides are, are moving around all those different cells, but also they haven't sclerotized, which is the word for when their shell hardens up. Um, and so that there is some time when they're soft and squishy just like the larvae are, uh, before they turn uh, black and, and their colors. And that happens with all insects that go through this, yeah. Great, um, there's a yeah. few comments of thank yous and what a really great session that was and a really mm -hmm. great comment from Carla. So if you want to take a look in the chat, that would be fantastic. Great. And I will start, I'll share my screen now. That's all. Okay, thank you so much, everybody. Uh, give me a minute. All right. So thank you so much for coming to this fantastic uh, fantastic BD at home with Nancy today. We, we learned a lot of really cool things about wasps and their anatomy as well as their nesting of behavior. So if you do did enjoy this, feel free to go to one of these links to support us at BD Biodiversity Museum. And whoops, thank you again for joining us. And our next BD at Home session is next Wednesday. Um, I believe it is with the Pacific Museum of Earth. So our sister location that highlights a lot of our fossil specimens. And thank you again for joining. Uh, Okay, feel free to uh, let yourselves out. If you have any other questions though, you can go ahead and ask, um, but you can go ahead and leave the room. Yeah, thank you everyone. We'll see you next time. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tina. Thank you, Miles and Elizabeth. Okay, so.